you've got a heavier ion, you can maybe knock a proton out. In case three, is if, if you shatter it, you get uh, three alphas that, that you can then maybe look at and, and they will leave a, a path. So, uh, from the books, they showed, you know, okay, uh, the various energy levels of 0.114 MeV uh, is the black line, uh, 0.25 MeV is, is the blue line, uh, you know, 565. You can see, see the pillars here. And, and you can see ultimately you get enough energy, you get a recoil of carbon and oxygen, and, and ultimately you get the, enough energy that you shatter the uh, carbon atom and, and turn into three alphas. So, so this was out of the physics journals and on what you, how you analyze CR39. Next. Okay, here's what we had. And, and again, we recopied the 2.45 MeV neutron and a 14.8 MeV neutron in the red and blue, and the green is what we saw. So we were seeing, as you can see, very similar uh, results, uh, indicative of DD fusion and uh, DT fusion or, or uh, deuterium helium-3. So anyhow, we were seeing results that were very indicative of this in, in, our, in our rare work. Um, I mentioned the uh, earlier that you know when we sometimes would see these little uh, you know double or triple that looks like kind of a, a three-leaf clover event, and so here you see some of these again. This came from from the physics community, and this this is the example of, of a carbon atom being shattered by a neutron, and and you see the three uh, ionized particles that that go off, and. And uh, you know, carbon CR39 contains 32% uh, carbon-12. Uh, it also contains uh, oxygen. It takes a 9.6 MeV neutron impacting that carbon-12 to break it in half or to shatter. So if if we have less than 9.6 <coughs> MeV, it's not going to leave one of these tracks there. Okay. Well, clearly, here you can see some of these tracks that, that are very very much like what the hot fusion papers were saying uh, was evidence of high energy neutrons. Uh, this came out of, you know, again, some of the hot fusion papers on, on, uh, on what a DT uh, neutron would look like. And, and you can see that we matched this very well. We published this in Nature Wissenschaften uh, in January of 2009 was when it, when it came out. And, uh, if you think about it, a neutron has just as high a probability of smashing into carbon in the middle of the CR39 as it does on the surface or, or on the backside. So what we had to do was we would etch through and, and stop the etching and examine the CR39 uh, after every couple hours of etching. So you know we were looking through and, and sure enough, we would start initially, you would not see any anything, no, no evidence of a neutron. Uh, you start etching, and maybe on the third or fourth etch, you begin to see something, and, and then ultimately you, you see uh, the distinguishing triple track that, that we see here. Okay, uh, you do the let curve for this, and, and uh, you know, let curves for alphas. I had this in an earlier, but uh, repeat it here. You take the 9.6 MeV that it takes just to shatter the carbon, and then you take the distance here. Uh, you, you apply that to the left curve and you get the number of MeV, and in this case, uh, approximately 12.3 MeV. Now, uh, geometrically, you know, we're only, we're only looking down. So, so, and we're only able to measure the two-dimensional uh, you know, here. And, and obviously, one of these could be going down. You know, the, the short one, in fact, could, could have gone down rather than, and it could, could in reality, be the longest of, of the three. Uh, we, we weren't able to, dis to distinguish that. So, so this is kind of a minimum energy for the neutron that causes damage. Um, we, for the previous work, we, uh, where we said this is consistent with DD and DT fusion, we used uh, information from the literature. Well, as it turns out, uh, DOE has a lab in Santa Barbara where they have a DT and a DD fusion source. And so we talked to them and asked if, if you know, we could come up and use their DT source, expose our CR39 to their source, and then 
generate another piece of CR39 from the same sample and, and compare the neutrons that were generated. And, and we did that, and you can see amazing similarity there. Um, we asked the folks at, uh, at the DOE lab if they would uh, be willing to be co-authors with us, and, and they said they would, except it would have to be approved by DOE, and, and so sent the paper, it went to DOE for approval and, and a couple of levels of review, and it, and it came back and it said, yes, we could publish it as long as we put the statement in the back that are uh, acknowledging DOE, that DOE provided support for this work and, and so on. We thought, throw us in that uh, you know, briar patch. Here, here DOD, DOE is now endorsing our work. So, so this paper, we just got the galley proofs on it early this week. Uh, it will be coming out in the European Physics Journal of Applied Physics within hopefully the next month or two. Uh, and, and it includes not only yeah. from, from, from DOE. Oh, nice. uh, we don't know how high up this went. Now, DOE also has a library, and they're supposed to post all of their papers in their library, and it hasn't shown up there yet. Uh, so uh, we, don't, we don't know if there's a problem or, that, you know, they, they've said, no, it, it always takes a while. So in any event, uh, this paper is going to be coming out soon, and, and it shows the, the neutrons uh, from a DOE DT fusion source. Uh -huh. um, this is some work uh, that was done at, at SRI, uh, where Mike McCoubrey is from, and, and uh, only Fran Tancella did this uh, uh, about four years ago. You know, one of the, the concerns was, can others replicate our work? And so. Steve Cribbett uh, took upon himself to, to, and we helped him uh, have what he called the Galileo Project, where people were able to, he, we wrote the protocol down. We didn't provide any hands-on information. If someone had a question, they could call and ask us. But in doing that, uh, people at Stanford, a professor at Berkeley, a professor at, at the University of Minnesota, a retired physics professor from Montclair State in, in New Jersey, all replicated our work. And, oh, by the way, uh, for three years, the senior class of chemistry, senior chemistry class at UCSD has done the experiments using CR39 and, and generated PITS. So uh, I, I will tell you, there is no reluctance on the part of students to get involved in this. And, and uh, they have published papers. They came and briefed at the, the American Chemical Society meeting a year ago on the results. In this case, though, in addition to CR39, we had a BF3 Rimball neutron detector and, and you can see here there was about a 14 hour period with an extremely high neutron flux and, and other peaks in here too, significantly above, above average. So, uh, you know, anyhow, this again, now we have CR39 and the BF3 direct readout next. Uh, we started looking at the flux that, that observed and, and went through a bunch of calculations. Uh, the Rimball, when you look at its efficiency and how many neutrons were produced, how much of the surface it would have seen, you know, from the, the uh, if you assume the, electro the neutrons were being emitted over you know, 306 degrees spherically, uh, we, we estimated that we were seeing about 10 to the 6 neutrons per second for that 14 hours. Uh, we have observed in, in our CR39, and we've done the same thing on the order of 10 to the 5th neutrons per second integrated, and, and so, Again, for physics terms, we're pretty close. Next. Um, I mentioned these ejecta sites, and, and it's interesting how the consistency of about 50 microns across and, and, and about 20 microns deep, uh, we did some calculations to figure out how much energy was involved in ejecting that. And, and you know, of course, it would have to, have to happen extremely fast so that the heat isn't conducted away. And, and if you use the conventional branching ratio for DD and DT fusion, um, then you know basically we're, we're saying we're getting about three times 10 to the 10th nu nuclear fusion reactions per ejecta site. And when we calculate that, we're getting about 10 to the 7th fewer neutrons than conventional physics would, would predict. Now the good news for me is that means I'm still alive. <laughs> As I said, if, if uh, if you were producing that much heat, then, then you should have enough neutrons that you would all be dead. Uh, so clearly, we're not following